So, okay, so let's have a, I think you'll find this fascinating, some amazing research which they're doing uh, in developing countries, but also here in the uh, U.S. Uh, we have a, a great chance to uh, hear about the latest, so I'll turn this over to my colleague. Um, thanks, for mu thanks so much for staying for the last panel. We're going to talk about research that's relevant to all of these themes that have, that have been discussed so far. Um, my name is Emily Breza. I'm an assistant professor here at Columbia Business School. And I'd like to start by just talking about, um, quite briefly, some of my recent research. And this is hot off the presses. I guess I need the clicker. I'm going to focus today on asking the question, does microfinance foster business growth and which kinds of businesses benefit the most from, from this kind of financing? But I think to situate this a bit, this session is meant to examine the research that we have so far on how can we help small businesses grow and how can we help them thrive. So I think two of the main missing markets that are often uh, highlighted are the credit market and the skills market. And some of the panelists today will have something to say about both of these things, but then there are also other markets that we might think don't function quite so well. So as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on microfinance's role in trying to overcome some of these hurdles and to uh, fix some of the credit constraints. And really, how much can we rely on microfinance to do this, or do we need another kind of product? And then related to some of the other conversations that were going on earlier, what is the right level of regulation for the microfinance sector and for, for sort of the consumer finance or entrepreneurial finance sector in general? Okay, so this is a picture of some microfinance borrowers in Hyderabad, which is a city, a large city in India. And it's been in the news lately for microfinance reasons since 2010. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and you know, this is a standard meeting where the women come and they make their payments or they get their loan disbursement. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there were really great hopes for what microfinance would do, but some of the recent research has been a bit mixed, and I think there's a lot of disappointment around what we know about microfinance. So just to highlight some of the results, so there is a positive effect on business creation. It does seem that the businesses are expanding, but there aren't any impacts on consumption, on female empowerment, or on um, education spending, for example. And I think lots of people are kind of wondering, well, why, what went wrong? It seems that the businesses do need financing. It seems that this is a lower cost financing vehicle. Where are we missing? What's, what's going wrong? So I think the first thing we need to do is just ask, who's borrowing? You know, this is sort of a one-size-fits-all product with many different kinds of, of clients and customers in mind. So the first kind is what I call uh, a novice entrepreneur, somebody who's not necessarily in business before microfinance comes to town, who also might not use the entire micro loan for a business purpose. And this is, this is perfectly fine. Uh, Professor Melanothan's work showed that, this, that there's a lot of room for this to matter. But then we have other businesses, like these businesses in the background, that have a storefront, they're a little bit more permanent, they might have one or two employees, and I'm going to call these seasoned entrepreneurs. They already had a business idea before microfinance came to town. So, you know, if we just split the sample of people who borrow from microfinance and say, let's look at the business impacts where we think we should find them, what happens to our, our prognosis about microfinance or our interpretation about what microfinance is doing? So what I'm going to do is just show you a little bit of data from one of these early microfinance experiments, but we just collected this in 2012. So the treatment group was experimentally given microfinance six years ago uh, for the first time. And the control group was experimentally given microfinance four years ago. Now in 2010, the, uh, the, the, the state government uh, where Hyderabad is situated decided that microfinance was usurious and it should be outlawed altogether. So the people, when we surveyed them, hadn't had access to microfinance for two whole years. So the first question is, you know, do the seasoned businesses look any different because of microfinance than these novice businesses? And the answer is a resounding yes. So these bars are the treatment effects. The bars themselves are the difference between treatment and control. On the left-hand side, we're looking at the stock of business assets. The dark bar is the novices, and the orange bar are the seasoned entrepreneurs. So we're not seeing so much happening with these novices. They sort of entered and then they might have left when microfinance went away. But there's a persistent and quite large effect for the seasoned entrepreneurs. Similarly, they're still um, plowing money into their business. On the right-hand side, we see that they're still investing in their business, even when microfinance is no longer there. 
Similarly, the revenues, the inputs are going up even now, even in 2012, after microfinance uh, stopped. So this is the effect of having had more access to microfinance in the past, but no longer microfinance today, and there are still persistent effects for this particular subgroup. Uh, similarly, they're working harder, they're working more hours in their home businesses, and they're finding ways to finance their businesses outside of microfinance, so the seasoned entrepreneurs are able to go to their family and friends and borrow uh, as much as they can uh, to kind of complement the investments they made under microfinance. So I think, you know, the initial read on the microfinance impact evaluations was kind of depressing, but if you're really interested in business growth and you look where you might expect the business growth to be happening, it, the outlook is a lot better. So I think that you know, this does show that the firm, these firms were capital constrained. Uh, relaxing their credit constraint was really good for them, especially, even in the long run when microfinance left. And that some of these regulations to wipe out microfinance in one blow are probably quite, quite negative for, for these entrepreneurs who, who seem to be benefiting. Um, so, you know, I think the, there are some outstanding questions that the other panelists are going to start to answer. You know, how important are these credit constraints in other settings in the U.S. for firms that are slightly larger? How about the missing skills training? How, what happens when we try to provide skills training to entrepreneurs? Can we turn these novice entrepreneurs into seasoned entrepreneurs? And so uh, it's um, my great pleasure to introduce my colleagues and, and co-panelists. So first, uh, Chris Blattman will speak. He's the Assistant Professor of International and Public Affairs and of Political Science here at Columbia uh, University. He's an expert in the economics, politics, and policy of developing countries, and his recent focus has been on conflict and post-conflict regions. And he's done extensive consulting for governments and for international institutions such as the World Bank and the United Nations. So we're thrilled to have him talking about his work. Uh, in, in some conflict and post-conflict areas. Next, I'm thrilled to introduce Ronnie Chatterjee, who's the Associate Professor at Duke's Fuqua School of Business. He, he's joining us from North Carolina. We're thrilled to have him. He's an expert in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship policy, and he has firsthand domestic policy experience through his tenure as a senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. So thank you for making the trip. And finally, I, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Amit Candlewall, who's the Gary Winnick and Martin Granoff Associate Professor of Business, also at Columbia Business School. And he's an expert in international economics and has studied the strategic responses of firms uh, to trade liberalization and to other macroeconomic currents. And he's an expert in slightly larger businesses on the small business spectrum, so it'll be great to hear uh, his perspective looking at small and medium enterprises in Pakistan. So I'll turn over the floor to, to Chris. I think you should just change the... at the very end. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so what Emily called the novices are, are essentially what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. This is a picture from uh, Liberia. It's a group of um, street youth. Uh, most of my work are with poor, unemployed young men and women, uh, which of course is probably the majority of people on the planet. Uh, and a lot of these people have very little experience with uh, any kind of business like we would have seen, like a market stall, but but nonetheless, they're doing business. You're not unemployed in Africa. You're not unemployed in most very low-income countries because if you have no employment, uh, you don't eat. And so what you are, you're engaged in usually maybe 10 or 15 or 20 hours of very low productivity, low-wage employment, and you're earning perhaps less than a dollar a day. Uh, these are wheelbarrow boys who ferry goods through the market. These are actually wheelbarrows they rent by the day. Uh, and and that, this is a good example of the kind of uh, non-agricultural thing which people might do for a few hours a week in order to eco to living. <clears throat> so the big issue in a lot of these countries um, when it comes to employment and generating jobs, which of course is, maybe it's not the number one, but it's often the number two or number three issue on the mind of your average developing country president and 
increasingly these days uh, the developed country presidents. Uh, and the big issue is there's no firms. Uh, no firms is a strong word, there's, there's very few. I actually have some work that I do in firms in Ethiopia. This is a garment factory in Ethiopia. Uh, but there aren't very many of these in Liberia or Uganda. Uh, not even in that many in, in Kenya or Ethiopia, for, for, for example, where there's at least a very small manufacturing workforce, maybe 5% five, five of the workforce. So most employment uh, is self-employment. This is either going to be on the farm or it's going to be some kind of non-farm employment. And it's essentially up to you to provide all the things that you need in order to generate that. So what's holding poor people back from having higher return uh, self-employment, given that there's very little they can do about firms? And this is not the question that most presidents or most programs or most policy organizations ask themselves. They usually ask, how can we create jobs? Uh, and in some sense, this starts off the whole discussion wrong. I think what we need to ask is what is holding back the poor? What is constraining the poor from increasing the amount of work, uh, from borrowing what they need to expand their enterprise and so forth? Uh, and so what are some of these binding constraints? And can we relieve them through either uh, private sector interventions or public sector interventions? And the good news is that uh, there seem to be a relatively, there's, there's growing evidence that a handful of fairly simple, straightforward interventions seem to work. And these are interventions that have both private and public sector uh, solutions. Um, so I'm going to talk about three field experiments. Um, uh, the first one of these is, a, is one that I started in 2009 in northern Uganda. Northern Uganda was affected by war for more than 20 years. And in the aftermath of that war, people were returning to their villages and rebuilding their lives. Uh, and what we did is we identified, we were working with an organization in about uh, 120 of these villages that had identified the 15 poorest people in those communities. And the vast bulk, about 85% were women. Uh, and the idea was how to stimulate their incomes above what they were, which was above 10, about $10 a month in cash. And the solution they came upon was to provide a cash grant in order for them to start up uh, a non-agricultural enterprise of some sort, which was generally meaning they'd go into petty trading. They'd go to the city, they'd buy things, they'd bring them back, they'd sell them in the market. Maybe they'd do some cottage production at home. Uh, and they'd receive that and, and, and some business planning and basic business training. But really, the main focus of the intervention was this grant. And the way this was studied is, uh, in 60 of the villages, 900 of the women received it right away, and 18 months later, 900 uh, of the women in the other 60 villages received it, and this was done by random draw. And this gave us an 18-month sort of window in which to look at the impacts of the program. And what we saw was very impressive. We saw that most of these women invested in a small retailer trading enterprise. So you can see this woman uh, goes and buys uh, little dried fishes and sells them in the local market. Uh, their work hours increased by about 50%, their uh, earnings increased, their earnings doubled, and their savings tripled. Now, doubling your earnings from $10 to $20 a month is not a huge deal in absolute amounts, but when you're making $10 a month, getting an extra $10 a month is truly enormous. Uh, also in northern Uganda, I worked with a different, think of maybe the next strata of young men and women up. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are young men and women who are not the poorest in their communities. They're about the median, maybe just a little bit above the median, which means maybe they earn a dollar or two a day, which still isn't very much. They typically have a grade six or grade seven education. They're somewhat literate because grade six or grade seven is when you typically learn to read in a lot of Ugandan schools. And these were people who had slightly greater ambitions and slightly greater abilities because of this schooling, and they wanted to take on skilled self-employment. And so the government put together a program whereby groups of 20 youth could get together and apply for uh, a grant of four, uh, roughly $400 per person, which is a lump sum, essentially, of $8,000 per group. And all you had to do is put together a business plan. Here's how we're going to spend this money, basically, to start uh, trades. Uh, often, this is going to be carpentry, welding. Uh, so we see welders here. You saw some carpenters earlier. Uh, tailoring a hair salon, and they would submit this proposal to the government. If the government approved this proposal, then the central bank would make a transfer of eight thousand dollars to the bank, a bank account in the names of the five leaders of this group. Uh, and this seems like a very risky development strategy, dropping essentially their annual income on them in this giant lump sum uh, in in one fell swoop. Uh, and so, what happened for this? Basically, just in return for plan. And what happens is impressive. We follow these. 
uh, these, these guys over, over two years. You can just imagine how many people apply. Tens of thousands of people. This is just money falling from the sky. Uh, and so we follow uh, 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 about 265 groups that receive the grant and about 270 that do not over time, over four years, uh, interviewing them before, two years later, and four years later. And we see that earnings go up by 40%, work hours are increasing 17%. They, uh, about 10% of them are actually formalizing their firms and they're beginning to hire, hire other people part-time. So this is a hugely successful uh, program with huge returns on capital. Um, but most of my work is actually in these conflict regions with much higher risk youth than this. These two groups I've talked about uh, are not, uh, we're, we're, we're worried about people being poor because we're good humanitarians, all right, or if we're the government because they're our citizens. Uh, but we're also worried about some young men boring being poor because we're worried about what they're going to do otherwise. Uh, these are ex-combatants who occupy, uh, illegally occupy a rubber plantation in Liberia shortly after the war. Uh, we were working with uh, ex-combatants in Liberia who were um, smuggling, who were engaged in crime rings, who were in, uh, illegally mining gold and tapping rubber uh, throughout the country and trying to identify not just how do we legally employ these young men, but actually is that actually going to make them less likely to engage in what are some very profitable uh, criminal activities and potentially mercenary recruitment in the region, which is very common. And the intervention in this case was, can we actually turn swords into plowshares? Can we encourage these young men to become farmers by giving them the skills that they need to be farmers and the inputs they need to start a farm? Things like seeds and tools, or if you want to raise animals, chickens and pigs. And, and, and the vaccinations and the things that you need. And so the program that's offered to them is four months of res residential agricultural training. So now not just giving them capital, but really intensifying the amount of training that they get in order to become essentially much more skilled farmers. And then about $125 in these capital inputs, be it seeds and tools for vegetable farming or uh, chickens and the things you need to build chicken coops or piggeries uh, if, you wanna, if you're interested in animal raising. And the underlying assumption here is that the main constraint wasn't the capital, but the main constraint was the skills that they needed. Uh, and what we actually see is these, these guys are quite successful. The earnings rise, and there's this shift out of illicit activities into legal ones by about 20%. So they diminish their uh, illicit hours by about 20%. They increase the, their hours in farming by about 20%. And this is after just a year and a half. And so we might expect to see this accelerate over time. But it was all contingent on receiving the capital inputs. Those who had, uh, what, what ended up happening was those who chose the vegetable package got it, and those who chose animals, those the chickens and the pigs, for various reasons, never arrived. And the people who didn't get the capital uh, didn't make this shift at all. Uh, what's more, at the time we were running our inline survey, a war in Cote d'Ivoire broke out in late 2010, early 2011, and the recruitment networks activated as Liberian generals went over and began to start uh, recruiting through their old networks and there were recruitment meetings and things that were held and the men who were uh, not only in the program uh, but actually received the capital were dramatically less likely to be attending these recruitment meetings making movements towards the border etc so this actually seems to diminish the likelihood of mer mercenary recruitment but those who didn't receive the capital inputs were just as likely to participate in some of these recruitment activities so the common thing across all of these studies and, and many more is capital. Capital seems to be a binding constraint on the young and poor and unemployed. And microfinance generally isn't uh, available for them, uh, mainly because microfinance might not exist in these villages, uh, but mostly because microfinance is often much too short term, much too costly for this group. So in, these, in both countries, uh, they, can, they can borrow at maybe an interest rate of 10% per month, which turns into annualized interest rates or 100 to 200% a year. Uh, but usually they can only borrow for a two or three month horizon. And none of these businesses, however successful that we've seen, none of these transformations would have been realized in three months or achieved those, however high their rate of returns, they were never reaching the point of 100 or 200% annualized returns on investment. And so as a result, uh, adding microfinance, at least conventional rates, wasn't helping them. Um, one of the things that we're finding more and more evidence for that my studies are merely one example of is that for this lower strata of society, which frankly is one or two billion people, cash transfers are producing quite dramatic results, partly because they're very, very cheap relative to most inter interventions and because they're relieving 
what is for most people the, the most binding constraint, which is this initial startup capital for, for enterprise. Thank you. So first of all, as the, uh, the only out-of-town guest on the panel, I want to thank everyone for putting this together uh, and inviting me, both to Bruce um, Kogut and the entire staff who helped put together the conference, and also Emily for uh, convening us and my fellow panelists. Um, I was struggling to think about the right title for my presentation. That's OK. Uh, so I've left this slide blank just for the beginning to, to leave you in suspense. It's quite unorthodox. We, we, we don't do this usually in North Carolina or in New York. But as I was up here on the plane thinking about what I want to title the presentation, I decided I really wanted to make this a little bit different. Um, let me just provide some comments on entrepreneurship and, uh, and inclusive growth from the US context where I've done most of my work. And through that, I might sneak in a paper or two that I've written and tell you about the results. So in terms of the title, I was sort of stuck between two things, and I'm hoping you can maybe help me decide between two titles for the talk. So here's the first title, you know, sort of bold and declarative, why we should encourage everyone to become an entrepreneur. That often seems to be the title of, you know, sort of most people, the evangelists for entrepreneurship uh, around the country and around the world. Everyone should be an entrepreneur, right? Everyone should get off the bench and start a business. And so that was one idea, you know, as a person who studies entrepreneurship, has done entrepreneurship, has done policy impacting entrepreneurship, I am a cheerleader for entrepreneurship. At the same time, there was another title that I was considering that I thought was equally valid for the things I'm about to say, and that's why we should not encourage everyone to be an entrepreneur. So as you can see, I'm, I'm a little bit of two minds, uh, both because of studies I've done and also some of the policies I've seen in action or in inaction, if the case may be. I'm going to talk about where that tension exists and, and why I think it's really important for a group like this. So let me just start with what you already know, but sort of how I think about the world. Entrepreneurship is hot. You know, if you're in a business school like Duke or Columbia, MBA students want to do it. Okay, the biggest clubs at Duke's Fuqua School of Business are probably the biggest clubs at Columbia, I would guess. You can tell me if I'm wrong. The EVCC Club, the Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Club, and the Social Impact, the Net Impact Club. So either you're an entrepreneur or you want to save the world, probably both, okay, if you're an MBA student. This, these are the students who are coming to us nowadays. A generation ago, they would have gone to public policy school. Now they're coming to business school. That's exciting. It makes it a great time to be a business school professor. Now, there's a lot of scholars, as you can tell, on this panel and the other ones you've seen who want to study entrepreneurship, and there's quite a lot of reward for that. There's lots of endowed chairs from successful entrepreneurs in their names for faculty who can develop and do research, and that's why you're seeing a tremendous proliferation in the research on entrepreneurship and a lot of improvement in the research methodologies. My co-authors are going to share a lot of their research with you, and you'll see experimental methods, which are relatively new in the entrepreneurship field, but obviously generating great insights, and that's really the future of what we're trying to do. Now, policymakers also want to encourage it. And that's what I was doing at the White House. Um, I was a senior economist for small business and entrepreneurship for President Obama. So every politician, Democrat, Republican, wants to have a line in their speeches about small business. Right after apple pie and little league comes small business. Here's the problem. Uh, a lot of folks in business schools want to talk about entrepreneurship. And we end up confounding the two as if they're synonyms, and they're not. And in fact, the policies to encourage small business and the policies to encourage what we think is entrepreneurship are usually quite different and sometimes at odds. And I think in a lot of discussions, that never really gets brought out. And that's something I've been writing a lot and thinking a lot about. And I want to talk about that in a little more detail in a second. Okay? My, my concern today is, you know, are we getting a little bit too caught up in the hype? You know, entrepreneurship seems to be the answer to every question, right? How do we reignite growth in the United States and around the world? Entrepreneurship. How do we solve vexing social problems that governments are unable to solve? Entrepreneurship. Right? How do we deal with poverty and, and, and emerging markets that haven't developed as quick as we want? Entrepreneurship. But I worry that you know, while we're trying to save the world, we might be getting ahead of ourselves in what entrepreneurship can really do and for whom. And so I'll speak a little bit both from kind of three perspectives, both a scholarly perspective. I'm uh, a scholar who studies entrepreneurship from a strategy and economics perspective. So finance is just really one part of the portfolio and not a main focus of my studies. But I'll talk about some of the research. I'll talk about policy and how we made decisions in the Obama administration, at least, and I think in a bipartisan fashion on Capitol Hill. And I'll also talk about a practical perspective as someone who's been advising a lot of firms, uh, both in the Research Triangle Park uh, and other places around the country, and also as a participant currently in my own entrepreneurial venture. 
And also, most of my talk, all of my talk will be focused on the U.S. And that's not to say that that's really where all of our focus should be. In fact, you, know, you might think the impact that we would make with our research would be much greater in some of the settings that Amit and Chris and Emily are going to talk about. But my experience uh, and interest has been in, in the U.S. context, so I'll limit it to that and I'll, I'll let you learn from the others on the international context. So, a couple things. Uh, when you talk to entrepreneurs, when you do surveys, when the National Federation of Independent Business, one of the trade groups does it, access to capital and access to credit uh, come up as big concerns for entrepreneurs. We've been talking about it pretty much all day. Often two sort of distinct things. I'll talk a little bit more about access to credit. A quick aside just on entrepreneurship versus small business. You know, in, a, in that speech that every politician gives, after they talk about Little League, after they talk about apple pie, they talk about small business and the reason we should support and subsidize small business. And that's jobs, right? Small businesses are supposed to account for a lot of jobs. And they list the number of small businesses and somewhere like 27 or 28 million. But don't take that number at face value. No matter what your political affiliation is or no matter which side of the aisle you're on, many, many of those businesses, probably about, let's say, 22 million, don't have any employees. So right now, right, if you're thinking about entrepreneurship, right, you're thinking about many, many, 22 million out of the 28 million or so are businesses without a single employee. And many of those businesses that we're talking about when we're cheerleading for small business are never going to grow, right? They're never going to grow beyond 10 employees, at least according to historical data. So let's be honest about kind of what we're thinking about in this sector before we think about policies, which is what we're going to do. Now, that's not to say we can't change it. That's not to say that we can't add jobs in small business. In fact, the people currently working in small businesses, because it's so large, is a huge part of the economy. These are really important for job creation for the actual small business owner. But in terms of growing small businesses, we really need to think carefully about sector. We really need to think carefully about the aspirations of the business owner as well. And these are some things I think that get lost in the debate when we talk about entrepreneurship and the policy level. People talk about job creation, but we know from studies from John Haltwanger at Maryland and others, right, the net job creation is really coming from the young businesses, right, that happen to be small. That's a really important distinction that Washington is just starting to get, and they haven't really changed that much about their policies yet, right? Young businesses happen to be small because they're new, okay, and we usually start off new. But that doesn't mean that all small businesses are going to create a lot of jobs. It means there's a subset, a very important subset of small businesses that are going to create a lot of the jobs, potentially. Okay? By the way, another job creating engine in the distribution is large firms. Okay? So if you're looking to be a job creation, we're also talking here not just about young firms, but also large firms that people have more trouble subsidizing, if, as we'll talk about in a second. Okay? So where do you get new business uh, funding from if you're an owner? There's a few sources. There's the three F's that everyone tries first. Your friends, your family, and your fools. Okay? Your fools might overlap with the first two, depending on your social network. Okay? Then you're going to go next to bank debt. David Robinson, my colleague at Duke, has done a lot of research looking at sort of sources of finance for small businesses, and bank debt's a bigger part of the equation than you might think. And home equity. Another colleague at Duke, Manuel Adino, has talked a lot about the fact that entrepreneurs are often cashing out money from the home for their business. Very common. The fourth one's the one, the only one that I've done research on, which is credit cards. Maxing out the credit card is, is sort of a rite of passage for entrepreneurs. And I dare say, compared to the other three that I've listed here, it might be the most inclusive of all the options that we have here today, right? A especially after credit cards were deregulated, right? You know, 70% of Americans have a credit card, and many other people have access to a credit card. Home equity, you have to have a home, right? Bank debt, you have to get the loan that we talked about was so hard. And your friends, families, and fools, you know, if you know rich people, that's great. But if you don't, it's a lot harder to tap those, right? So, Credit cards are almost a really great way, I think, of the four different sources here to study right, the impact of finance and entrepreneurship. But those of you who are economists in the room or those of you who are students who have taken the economics class, you know the problem here, right? We know credit cards and entrepreneurship are related, right? We all know entrepreneurs who use credit cards and max out their credit cards. We know that credit cards must facilitate entrepreneurship, except we don't really know, right, because we haven't done the perfect study. Right? It's really hard to do experiments like the ones on this panel with credit cards and entrepreneurship. I've tried. But we have, in a paper I wrote, a little bit of an experiment. Okay? It's a policy experiment. So it's not exactly as clean as what the other studies on the panel are going to be. But here's what we did. In a JFE paper that was published in 2012, we used a Supreme Court decision. As a person who worked in government, I'm always looking for interesting policy shocks. It was a famous decision called the Marquette decision. And without getting into the details of the Supreme Court decision, it had a huge impact. It basically deregulated the interest rate markets, the credit card interest rate market in the United States. Before that, states had caps, caps on the interest rates that they could charge on credit cards. Now, that might sound like a good idea if you're concerned about exorbitant interest rates. But guess what? What if you're a person on the other side of the fence who's not getting a loan? 
Let's suppose you're a person who's seen as high risk. Let's suppose you're a person who's discriminated against in the labor market for a variety of demographic factors. Well then, if I can't charge you a higher rate on the credit card, I'm just not going to give you a credit card at all. So in fact, when the credit card market was deregulated by the Marquette decision, state after state started to lift those caps in a really interesting way. And what Rob and I do is basically exploit that variation across states. We say, let's look what happens when one state lifts its cap. And then let's look at another and another. And let's make sure that we're actually getting the timing right and controlling for all the variables that could be going on in the state right? that you might not observe otherwise. And what we find is big impacts for entrepreneurial entry, but not just among everyone especially among African Americans. And so what we find in the study is when credit card interest rates are allowed to fluctuate, more people get credit cards, more people take credit card debt, and it seems to impact the African American community in a huge way. And what you find is self-employment among African Americans dramatically rises in those states that lift the caps, right? We then do a few checks to make sure it's actually what's going on is what we think is going on. So we look at states that have a history of racial discrimination. Those are states that were the last to remove their Jim Crow laws, the states that were the last to remove anti-miscegenation laws, because that's where you think that there'd be the most discrimination against African Americans. And guess what? Those are the states where you see the pickup in black self-employment the, the highest. So what we find here is when credit is expanded, when credit is democratized, it helps people who were shut out from these other channels. And that seems to be a good thing if you care about entrepreneurship and self-employment. So conclusion one from this is, it seems like increasing access to credit can foster what I think the topic of the conference is, which is inclusive growth. And I think that's probably why Bruce invited me because I wrote that paper, okay? But now I'll say the part that maybe we're not so sure about. If you looked at the New York Times Magazine just a couple days ago, they had a great article on how credit card debt can help the poor, right? Over 70% of Americans have credit cards. Most of us borrow for the big purchases. Right? But the conventional wisdom is actually the opposite. Right? We've been warning people for years, no, cut up the credit card. Right? Why? Because the legacy of subprime business models. Okay? So on the plus side, the New York Times Magazine article says, look, there's lots of innovations that can help low-income Americans grow savings and credit at the same time. There's these really interesting things going on in New York City right now where they lock a savings account. So you basically take a loan that you never see. Okay? That money goes in there and you start paying it back. That way, you build savings and credit at the same time. So the New York Times article is all about how great that is. But we still have this thing on the other hand, right? Which is that, you know, expanding credit can be a really good thing, but these subprime business models are lurking out there, right? The mortgage crisis has already been talked about at length earlier on. I like to add some corners of for-profit education, not all. But that's where a lot of people are borrowing money. I looked at those uh, businesses when I was at the White House, and a lot of them are built based on people getting grants, Pell Grants, or loans, right? And then not being able to pay those back on the other end and having a high debt load, okay? The other thing I'd say is like the association, a lot of research between credit card debt and consumer bankruptcy, right? So we also have to worry when you increase access to credit. Yes, you might get some good economic outcomes, more business starts, but you also might have some negative impacts. And I think that is, at least in my mind, the tension that's looming throughout this discussion today when we think about inclusive growth. And, you know, Keisha brought it up. Other people talked exactly about this in their talk. And so this is kind of what I've been interested in my research and popular writing is how do you balance those things? And primarily I think about it from a policy perspective, though our panelists from McKinsey um, and the other institutions I think are thinking about it more from a business perspective, which is great. So, one other important question that we don't get in our research, which I'd like to get at, just because someone started a business doesn't necessarily mean it was a good outcome. I'm all for empowerment through sort of economic mobility. I'm all for starting a business as a route to self-sufficiency, right? On the other hand, if these businesses failed within a year, which we don't know from our study, if these businesses right, put these people in enormous amount of debt they couldn't pay back, it might not have been a good outcome after all. So, it's not clear to me at least, and this is something I look forward to discussion if people disagree, that we should encourage everyone to be a founder of a business. In fact, I, I think it's probably a very narrow slice of people. And by the way, I'm not saying this uh, as an elitist looking down at low income people because I tell my MBA students the same thing, okay? There's a lot of joiners and they're not just, not just founders. I'd say 70% of the EVCC club is a bunch of joiners, not founders, and that's okay. Not everyone is meant to found a business and start a business. It's incredibly risky. We've all documented that in our research. So I think we ought to stop thinking, when we think about these public programs, for example, to encourage entrepreneurship and just count the number of business starts like they're each a success. I think we have to think about it a little bit differently, right? Maximizing the number of new businesses or increasing the self-employment rate isn't success. That necessarily. It could be, but we don't know that. And I think a lot of policy and a lot of incubator programs are premised on that, and I think it's incorrect, okay? The last thing is, you know, just remember, if small businesses aren't producing as many jobs as we think, if it's really young businesses, 
we ought to think very carefully about our public policies and the rationale for subsidizing small business and think about if we can be more targeted with thinking about young businesses, new businesses, and hey, if you care about job creation, large businesses. That's something a lot of people don't want to tackle and we need to think about. Okay, last slide. Um, I think we should accept really soon in our policy discussions that everyone's not going to be an entrepreneur. In fact, you know, and no, no incubator will ever take me up on this. Instead of measuring success by how many people come into the incubator and start a company, I think incubators should be about learning about yourself and whether you actually would make a good entrepreneur or not. And in fact, success should be how many people don't go into entrepreneurship after running into the incubator. Because after you express your intention to be an entrepreneur, and if you could go through the incubator and actually make a reasoned decision and say, you know what, I'm not cut out for this at all, to me, that sounds like success. You learned about yourself. But of course, no one would ever measure it like that. But I'm making this point, right, somewhat facetiously to say, counting the number of businesses that come out of an incubator, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me as, as the only quality metric. It can be one. I think we need to think a lot harder about metrics in this space. What are we actually trying to encourage? We used to tout home ownership among a lot of different groups in this country, and now we're starting to look at that differently and say, is home ownership really the goal, or is it something else? And I think it's very similar with entrepreneurship. Okay? Remember, the process of entrepreneurship can be something that's very valuable as a way to solve problems. Okay? That could be something you could teach, and I, I'm very optimistic about that. But the outcome of business formation, while interesting, really, we might actually be missing the broader issue, which is teaching people about the process, which I think could be more impactful. Remember, just a reminder, having the average stats in your head is really important about what the typical small business is. They measure value in the millions, not the billions. So if your students or other folks are coming to you talking about WhatsApp right, or Instagram, it's like the guys in my Sunday pickup basketball game trying to imitate LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony, right? These are one in a million, one in a billion kind of ideas and valuations, and it doesn't represent really anything about small business. These are outliers, okay? They're wonderful as inspiration, the same way I try to model my jump shot after Carmelo Anthony, but I'm a long way from that, okay? And that's what we need to think about. Now, many of these small businesses are never going to grow significantly. Many of them are going to fail within five years. So my assessment here at the end is we think about inclusive growth through entrepreneurship as the channel. Let's get a realistic portrait of what small business is in the United States first, okay? Then let's think about, with a dispassionate view of the outcomes we're actually gonna look for, think about what kinds of public policies we're going to support, and how the private sector can actually encourage a robust small business sector and more high-tech entrepreneurship by people who are well-positioned to do it. So I'll close it there. I look forward to people's comments. So I'm probably uh, positioned well as, uh, as the last speaker here because I'm not going to be talking about uh, uh, credit constraints and financial constraints. I'm, I'm going to be talking about other types of constraints that firms might face as they try to scale. And I'm going to be doing this in the context of Pakistan, uh, which of course is a very different context than it is here. But uh, I think the conclusions that we're, that we're beginning to learn from, from, from this particular study, uh, I think, uh, translate very easily to, um, to, to this setting. Um, I should also say that this is also work in progress, um, much more work in progress than, than what we've seen. So some of the results are going to be preliminary, and so I'll, 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 I'll caveat those, and then I'll mention some of the other questions that uh, some of the initial results are, are, are adding to. Okay, so I want to start off with this particular graph, which just plots the income per capita relative to the United States um, uh, on the x-axis, and how productive different countries are. And you can see that there's a very tight relationship. And so, although this doesn't suggest a causal feature, one of the things that we know is that what makes countries rich is, that, is how productively they're able to use their, uh, their inputs, right? Okay, so this is in general, this, this type of graph is, generates a lots of discussions. There's lots of potential explanations for this graph. Um, one thing that's also interesting is that if you look at any one of these countries in particular, like the United States, if you look within the country, you'll see a wide range in distributions and productivity uh, across firms. So, you know, the, the firms on the right are very productive firms, these are very unproductive firms, and there's a bell-shaped curve. Okay, so that's what you would get in a typical country, like a typical developed country like the United States. If you put a country like India, you also see a bell-shaped curve, but one thing you notice is that there's a lot of firms that are extremely unproductive that continue to persist. In the United States, these firms would either have to grow in order to survive or they would exit in the marketplace. And in developing countries, we tend to see this long right tail. There are some Indian firms that are as productive as, as American firms, uh, but the average is pulled down by this low end. 
Okay, so these kinds of studies are very useful for under, sort of framing the debate, which is we want to understand what are the constraints to these small firms from adopting new technologies, growing to scale, some of the constraints we've been talking about today, including financial constraints. But there's often two issues. So one is on measurement. So I've given you two graphs that show the productivity across countries and within countries. And a natural question to ask is that if Americans and Indians or Pakistanis are producing different goods, how is it possible to really compare how productive you are if one group, of, one group is making uh, surgical instruments and another group is making nuclear reactors? Okay. And even within a country, uh, how can you measure the productivity uh, of two different products like Tata's, uh, uh, Tata's Nanos versus Maruti's uh, uh, Swift car, right? Two diff very different cars. How do you measure how productive one car is rather, as a, rather than the other? And there are confounding factors, right? So there's many possible explanations that can drive both of these figures that, uh, that I've shown you here. Okay, so for example, a typical Indian firm might be using second or third generation technology. Is it because the consumers in that market don't demand the latest products, which is why the firms don't, don't uh, innovate and, 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 and adopt the latest technologies? Or is it because they are constrained in capital, for example? And the policy prescriptions hinge very vitally on separating these two systems. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go walk through a, a particular study, which I think gets around a couple of these and, and raises some interesting questions as to what are the constraints facing firms that are trying to scale. Uh, and we're going to do this in the context of uh, soccer ball producers in Pakistan. And some of the questions that we're interested in understanding is, if firms are provided with a new and beneficial technology, do these firms adopt? Right? And if they do adopt, what are the characteristics of successful adopters? And if they don't adopt, why don't they adopt this? And I'll be very explicit about what I mean by the technology in a moment. The second thing we're interested in understanding is does the technology spill over beyond the firm? Okay. So uh, once you introduce a new technology into this marketplace, does that technology start to diffuse? Do more firms start to adopt this technology? And what are the characteristics of the firms that are the most effective spreaders and receivers of those technologies? And then finally is a question I'll come back to in the end, which is why aren't the firms in some sense using the most improved technologies to begin with? All right, so that's something I'll come back to. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about the, the context that we're working in. Uh, we're working in a town in, in Pakistan known as Sialkot, which is right on the border between, between Pakistan and India. So Pakistan's in the news for lots of reasons that it shouldn't probably be, want, want, doesn't want to be in the news for. But this town is actually like a shining star in, 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 the, in the country. It's a vibrant source of manufacturing activity. Uh, and one of the things that this town produces is 70% of the world's hand-stitched soccer balls. Okay, so all the soccer balls that are used in, uh, in the leagues in Europe and, and, and South America uh, that are hand-stitched, these are balls that are made in this particular town, which is a pretty surprising thing given that there is basically no domestic demand for soccer ball in this, in this country. It's a cricket-loving country, not a soccer ball. So it's an, an, an in interesting quirk in history that why the producers are there. In this town, there's about 140 active firms. They range from the very best firms uh, these are the ones who supply Nike and Adidas and so forth, uh, and then some very small firms, and all of them, as I said, export products. Okay, so in order to understand the technology that, so we introduced a new technology that lowers their cost of production. And so we were interested in, do, are they going to adopt the technology, and then how does that technology spread? So in order for you to understand the technology, you need to know a little bit something about how soccer balls are made. Uh, so if there's one thing that I hope you uh, leave the conference with is you'll have a very good understanding of how soccer balls are produced. Okay, so there's four, basically five stages of producing a soccer ball. Okay, the first stage is you take artificial se sheets of leather, which are known as rexine, and you laminate them with, uh, with uh, cotton and polyester sheets, which basically forms the shell of the ball. Once you take that, um, once you take those sheets and you dry them, you cut them using a, uh, using a hydraulic press and a, met uh, and a metallic dye. Okay? And you can see that they're cutting hexagons and pentagons, and something I'll come back to. Once you cut the hexagon and pentagons, you print the logos. This is where the Manchester United logo would be put on. Uh, you stitch them together, and then you inflate them. Okay, it's a very simple technology. But one thing that's, that's very useful about this setting is that the very large firms and the very small firms all produce soccer balls in the exact same way. Right? So if you introduce a technology, the returns to that technology should should be equivalent across all these firms because they're all doing the same thing. All right, so what is the technology that we, that we introduced? So every soccer ball that you see uh, is, follows a standard buckyball design, which is 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. 
And those panels are cut from those expensive sheets of, of artificial leather. That accounts for most of the, most of the, of the cost of, of, of a ball. Right? So uh, this is, again, the hydraulic press that they were using. The typical, uh, the existing technology prior to us going into this market and studying this, this particular intervention was to cut hexagons and pentagons using a two-piece metal die. And we can see here that the shapes are flush. They're, they're joined together. Uh, you can see this guy moving a uh, two-piece two die across this sheet. Now, it turns out that if you think about the shapes of a hexagon and pentagons, a hexagon will completely fill a plane. And so there's very little waste of raw material, but pentagons don't. And it turns out that these firms were, you know, the hexagons were, um, were tessellating the planes. So there's very little waste of raw material. These are the leftover sheets of Rexine. But they had not optimized how they placed the the, the pentagons, right? So there is qu quite a bit of waste, um, as you can see from the sheet, uh, on the pentagon sheet. All right, so prior to, you know, we didn't know anything about producing soccer balls, um, and so we paid for a consultant to come up with a cutting innovation that could potentially be used. We offered a large sum of money, much larger than the income per capita of the country. Uh, that one individual that we could find failed, okay? <laughs> so my co-author, who's a, a colleague of ours at, at Columbia University, um, uh, in the economics department, Eric Verhoeven. Um, so I tend to watch Netflix at night. Eric watches YouTube videos. Right? So Eric was watching a YouTube video of how soccer balls are produced in China. And he noticed that the Chinese firms had layered the Pentagon shapes in a very different way. And what he realized was that their placement of the Pentagons was more optimal than the existing placement. Right? And it turns out that that placement was the optimal way to tile pentagons on a hexagon sheet, or sorry, on a rectangular sheet. Now, Eric could have actually gone to the Journal of Discrete and Computational Geometry, a paper written by Cooperberg and Cooperberg, um, or, as we later find out, uh, he could have gone to Wikipedia, <laughs> which has the solution, something I'll come back to, uh, which raises a question. All right, so Eric um, and his wife, his wife is an architect, um, developed a blueprint uh, for four pentagon dies. Notice this is four pentagons, not two pentagons, that are arranged in an offset manner. And that's, that's, the, that's the way that you're gonna pack more pentagon shapes into a, into a rectangular sheet. Um, and the previous technology could get about 250 pentagons. We can get slightly more, uh, 272. This is what the noob die looks like. Our conservative estimates of the benefits of this technology, if you account for all the costs of adoption, is that the median firm, which is producing about 10,000 balls a month, can recover the fixed cost of adoption after about three weeks of producing. Okay, so we think that this is a very clearly beneficial technology, even if we're way off on our analysis, it, they'll recover the costs within two months, right? And that's, that's being extraordinarily conservative. All right, so we devised an experiment. We were so sure that this, that this, that this, uh, that this technology would be adopted that we were more interested in, in how it would spread. And so we designed a, a, a study where a random set of firms get the technology, plus a demonstration on how to use it. Uh, some set of firms get some cash. We wanted to give the equivalent of the value of the, of the technology to control for possible, uh, one of the explanations that could be that these firms didn't come up with the innovation on their own because of credit constraints, and so this is a way to test for that. And then a third group didn't receive anything. And what we were hoping was to see that there would be adoption in the technology group, which would then spread to the, second, to the second and third groups. And initial evidence suggested that the die was in fact, uh, uh, was in fact uh, beneficial. So one of the largest firms, which was a control firm, uh, one of the largest firms, more than 250 50 employees, um, they had purchased 39 of these dies. They found out about it in the marketplace on nine separate occasions. Um, and as of last year, was using, was cutting more than half of their balls with this new particular die. But after 15 months, adoption rates were still low. Uh, this is very puzzling to us. So only six out of the original 35 treatment firms had actually adopted this die and were using it. And we were very puzzled as to why this would be the case. And so we did some more, did some more field work. And the survey evidence was pointing to uh, employee resistance. And so to understand the employee resistance, you have to understand how these workers are paid. And so the way that this individual who's cutting is paid is that he's paid per piece. So every one of these, every one of these panels is, is basically he's paid per piece. And so this individual, 
as well as other individuals in the firm who, who, had, who, had, who would have to um, modify how they, would, uh, how they would do their task with this new particular die, um, realized that, that this new die was potentially going to slow them down. And we think what they were doing was they were misinforming the owners about the benefits of this die. And so this suggests that there's a misaligned incentive within the firm. And so, so there's some, there needs to be some sort of, we have a technology innovation that has to complement organizational change in order to successfully, successfully implement this new technology. And so we're currently running a new experiment to test this hypothesis by, by changing wage contracts for employees. And the preliminary evidence suggests that, that this hypothesis um, uh, it, it seems to be at present in, in, as a present explanation for why these firms haven't adopted yet. And so, as I mentioned, this is still preliminary. We're going to continue to be following firms over a longer period of time. Um, this piece rate induced worker resistance could be blocking technology innovation. Um, and more and more fundamentally more, uh, changes, uh, broader changes that, um, that firms might need to be making. These are firms that are undergoing a lot of competition from lower end soccer balls from China, for example. And so uh, piece rates could be, uh, or, or more generally, organizational structures might need to change in order to account for, for, for uh, increased competition from, from countries like China. Um, and I think what this study also does, and this is perhaps something that we can, we can talk uh, in the panel, is, is kind of raise three, three questions. So one is, why don't the owners themselves just adjust the labor contracts on their own? Okay, so we don't have a really good under, uh, explanation for this. One potential, um, one potential explanation could be that employment contracts are bound by nor market norms. And so the employees uh, may, not, may resist changes in the employment contracts because simply this is how everyone in the market gets paid. Right? That's one potential explanation. Uh, the second one is why is it the case that, that uh, an economist uh, was able to come up with, who knows nothing about producing soccer balls, was able to come up with this innovation themselves, when clearly the solution exists in the world, uh, and these are firms who've been doing this task for, for often 30 years. Right? So some, there seems to have been some, you know, there's a question as to why these firms didn't come up with this innovation on their own. And then finally, uh, and this is sort of related to this first question, is what we don't see is a consulting market, a low-end consulting market, emerge in developing countries uh, that could help whittle away some of these inefficiencies. And I think that's a really deep question, which is there are lots of inefficient firms. There's lots of people, um, certainly at, at Columbia as, as, as well as in the broader community, who, can, who could probably go in and, and, and patch this firm up and, and make them more efficient. And Columbia has programs like the Pangea projects to, that do pro bono consulting work. Um, but essentially, we can think about this as an MBAs without borders. Right? So there seems to be uh, potential for a consulting market to emerge in order to whittle away some of these inefficiencies that can help scale um, firms going forward. Thank you, everybody, for your very interesting presentations. I'm going to start the questions off, and then we'll open up the floor to, to the audience. So, so I guess one, one theme that sort of came up in a couple of the presentations was, you know, maybe not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Um, and this sort of seems, or some entrepreneurs just seem to, to, to do it better than others. So, so what is the role of, and I guess the other, the other side of that is that some of these credit products, like the credit cards or even like microfinance, they're not really able to target people very specifically. So, you know, how paternalistic do we want to be in selecting, you know, who should be an entrepreneur, who should not? And, uh, you know, how else do we use policy to navigate this really important question? So, so maybe I'll just talk about the U.S. And mm -hmm. I, I think the challenges are different in different parts of the world. So I'll speak about what I've kind of seen. When I'm thinking about the great entrepreneurship education programs in the U.S., I'm thinking about the ones that offer, you know, to a wide variety of students, you know, whoever wants to come to pick up these skills. But the focus isn't necessarily starting a venture at the end. It's learning a process of how to solve problems. So I'll give you an example. I took the curriculum from one of the big entrepreneurship education uh, foundations, and I took it to a high school uh, in Durham, North Carolina, public school. 
And we just did a class on entrepreneurship that didn't really talk about starting a business. You know, the, the mechanics of you know forming an incorporated entity or an LLC, writing a business plan, more about the process of how to solve problems using entrepreneurial tools. And so that kind of approach, I think, to a large number of people can actually be really useful. And then through that class, I hope that some portion of the students decide, hey, this is really for me. You know, I want to take a big risk and open up my own record label, right, or start my own music company or whatever it might be. But many hopefully will realize, wow, you know, this is really, really hard and I'd actually be better off working in a small company or maybe working for a large company. But what I learned in the class, you know, and all the numerical skills and things we tried to put along with it will help them in whatever they do. So I think, you know, I'm for a broad-based entrepreneurship education in, in that point, but I, I think that the focus has to be and the counting has to be taken away from how many businesses we got out of it. And that goes from my high school class of 15 students all the way up to like initiatives from the Small Business Administration and the Department of Commerce. So, so in, in the U.S., that's why I think about it, but, you know, it could be very different in other parts of the world. So, you know, Chris and Amit might have a different view on that. Oh, so, I guess I'll approach it from a different perspective. And, and I'll talk about the India case, which is, um, and, and I'll highlight a, a different explanation for sort of these kinds of constraints, which is on the demand side. And so, one of the things that, um, uh, and this is probably more of a classical economist's answer to a question like this, is that one of the things that can stimulate growth is through international trade and exposure to markets. And so if you're in a, stuck in, an, in, an, in a market with, with uh, low levels of activity, um, export markets do open up this possibility for, for, for achieving scale. And so it's not necessarily, a, and then once those firms will self-select into which ones they're gonna scale faster than others. And, uh, it's, it's, and, 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 and you'll get basically firm, or people who were not, or potentially too small entrepreneurs self-selecting into working into these factories. And so we've seen that, for example, in Vietnam. So Vietnam got access to the U.S. market as a result of, um, uh, as a result of a trade agreement in 2001. And as a result, you've seen the share of employment in household enterprises um, actually decrease. And I would argue that's actually a good thing, to start to see much larger firms where they would go and they start as a low-end low -end factory line worker and then become a line manager and develop managerial skills along the lines that you're suggesting. And so that's a constraint not on the financial side, but actually on, on, on the demand side. Um, and I think that's more of a story than more, of a, more of, a, of a policy prescription for developing countries. The U.S. is mostly an open economy. Uh, and so I'll, I think I share your view a little. Yeah, but this makes a lot of sense. It's very, yeah. And Chris, did you notice any, which entrepreneurs seem to do a better job, um, given that you were just giving kind of a blanket cash grant or blanket training skills? Uh, so in our case, um, we, we went to a great deal of effort to try to predict who would be a successful entrepreneur using more data than you would ever be able to collect in a, another context and, and have very little success, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that, that's not entirely surprising. Um, a lot of people didn't know themselves uh, whether or not they were cut out to, to do well. Uh, with, uh, in a, in a, another study I, I alluded to, we're actually randomized factory jobs in Ethiopia. So the people who are lined, the 100 or 200 people who are lining up for 30 jobs at a factory, in eight factories, uh, those jobs get assigned by lottery to the applicants. And then some of the unsuccessful applicants get cash grants to start their own business. And what we've been finding so far, we're not finished yet, what we're finding so far is very interesting. Uh, number one, uh, three quarters of the people who get this factory job they've been lining up for quit. Within, usually within a few weeks. They, they really hate it. Uh, and these are miserable, low-paid jobs. They're not sweatshops. These, aren't, these, are, these are humane jobs. They're just terribly paid and they're not very pleasant. Um, and most of the people who get a cash grant uh, either don't start a business, and it's a large one, it's about four or $500, uh, don't start a business. Uh, and when they do, they stop. Uh, and they go and they try to find work in a factory. And so at the end of the year, only 30% of the people who got the factory job are still there and 30% of the people who didn't get the job managed to find one. So the people who found wanted a factory job found one, and the people who didn't didn't, and the, the people who wanted to do entrepreneurship managed to do it, and it just took time. And so it was this process of self-discovery, and all we did was subsidize it. Um, and, and that's not a terrible thing for public policy to do, is to subsidize people's process of self-discovery, which is costly and risky, uh, and, and then get to you know more efficient more efficient way, but it has to be cheap. This is the this is the problem when you're talking with really low income people. Um, if 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 the best program in the world raises a woman's income ten dollars a month, 
you know, if you spend $3 or $10 or what most nonprofit organizations do, which is hundreds of dollars targeting them or getting it just right or making sure that this is just the right program, then forget it. You know, that, that's money poorly spent. You could have just dropped that money on 14 other people uh, instead of tried to target it well. Uh, and so unless you can subsidize this process of self-discovery very well, um, I don't know, cash out of helicopters is not necessarily the worst uh, or the least cost-effective solution. Yeah, and just add one thing, I mean, in addition to being cheap, I mean, it, as people often want to replicate or scale successful incubators, and these incubators, quote, work really well. Techstars, Y Combinator, Blueprint here in New York. But why do they work, right? Is it treatment or is it selection, right? And if it's selection of the best people and we're spitting out great companies, then scaling that in areas with not a lot of deal flow is not necessarily going to work. So understanding, you know, they have to be cheap for, for sure if you want to sort of get outcome, but also understanding if the model you're scaling is even, even works sort of for a broader population, I think is important, not just that it's a selection mechanism. Thanks. Um, I, I guess uh, another question, I think you know both Amit's work and Chris's work and lots of other work, you know, studying financial literacy and other types of skills training, has just really painted a, a mixed, if not sort of depressing, picture of, of what these types of interventions can do. Yet we still have this feeling that you know there has to be a knowledge gap somewhere. After doing all of this work, wh how do you sort of think about this? You know, and, and rationalizing these two different, you know, the gut reaction and then the evidence. So I, I think I need you to clarify the question. Let me so, so where do we go now from here? So so it seems that there is there you know there's a human capital problem potentially. Mm -hmm. It seems that you know what should we do? We should train people. The training doesn't seem to work. So you know what what I think a lot of the work is drawing attention to, at least in the nonprofit and the public sector, is that uh, so very very few nonprofit organizations will show you how much their program costs. They'll tell you all about the impacts. Um, and then you say, well, how much did this cost per person? And they're like, oh, well, we've never really done that. You say, well, give me this, you know, you assemble the thing and you divide it and, and, and you add in and all the director's salaries and all these sorts of things. Uh, and, and it might be something like, it, it's to, to give a woman a cow in Rwanda costs $3,000 with Heifer International. Um, that's an absurd proposition. Maybe, maybe that cow, that impregnated cow, I should say, is, is, is worth that. But, but that's, kind of, that's an absurd proposition. And most training programs are equally expensive. So, so for me, it's not so much about the low impact that's problematic. It's actually the abysmal impact, essentially per dollar, that's, that's abysmal. And, and the concentration on a handful of, of interventions, of which cash transfers are just one, which are done very cheaply and transparently, I think, is is possibly the most uh, hopeful thing for me about uh, the transformation of development. And, 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 and microfinance too, even if it doesn't have these profound impacts on business growth. I mean, people like impersonal finance. People prefer to borrow from uh, an impersonal association than their entire friend and family network. This is just, you know, who wouldn't? And, and they value that, and, and it spreads like wildfire, and it's, and it's not that expensive to set up. So I think there are solutions out there, and if we concentrate on that. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure I have much to add on that. I, so from, from our experience, or from, yeah, from my experience in um, talking to these firms in, in Pakistan, some of these firms are run by exceptionally good entrepreneurs, like exceptionally good CEOs. They're great. They're working in a really, really tough market condition. I mean, it's a war torn country, um, and they're getting their products out, and they're, and they're very profitable. Uh, you know, we showed up to these guys, and we show that we start to go through what the cost benefit, uh, cost saving could be. And some of them, even though they're very small, they immediately start to do the calculations in their head. But then there's a whole bunch of other 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 CEOs of running small firms who have essentially look at this product and have not no idea what to do with it. So. Um, it's not clear to me that, that training would, would, would work for them. And, and I'll go back to, to, to the answer I gave before, which is that an alternative model is fewer firms that are larger. Um, but that requires not only, that's, that's, that, that, that score not only requires a shift in, in, in sort of the economics of, of how businesses are run there, um, but also in terms of cultural, uh, cultural instances. It's just, in, you know, in South Asia, people like to, to be, don't, don't like to have bosses. Um, but that's like a big cultural shift in, 
um, you know, I believe that policy can drive that, um, or you know, or incentives can drive that. Um, but we'll see. Great. So let's uh, open up the questions to the audience. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to comment. I've been working in this milieu of business schools at INSEAD since 2001, and this is the first time I've seen three guys on stage, four people on stage, speaking about small businesses. My perception is that most leading business schools are multinational service shops, and that the development of small business is a much lesser concern. And when you said there's no such thing as MBAs without borders, I thought, that's right. Why? What would you like to say about that? Why does that not exist? You were quite right in identifying the phenomenon. Well, I mean, there, there's the basic economics behind it, right? You're gonna spend a lot of money to go to an MBA program and you wanna return on your investment. But when I say that why is there no MBA without borders, that, that's a bit tongue, tongue in cheek. Yeah, Columbia does run programs where we do pro bono consulting work and students do these consulting gigs and, and I think I think that's a great, it, it's not only a great step for students to understand problems in, in these emerging markets, but also to implement their business skills. And to actually see which of these business skills probably don't translate into those particular markets. What's the program called? Uh, Pangea. Pangea. Pangea, yeah. Uh, I'll have, uh, San Sandra <laughs> runs the program, so. Um, but uh, I, I think there's a shift. I mean, if you look at, I mean, just speaking, there's been a massive decrease in the demand for finance electives at Columbia Business School, and people are moving into things like entrepreneurship or moving into trying to trying to go back to trying to work on social entrepreneurship in emerging markets. And I think this is a, a, a very hot space, and maybe it's just a sign of uh, cyclical demand, or, or maybe it's differences in trends. But um, it is different than what it was in 2001. Or, or in 1995, um, and I think that's a good thing. Well, you can pick with the microphone. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jun. I'm a PhD student at Columbia Business School. I have a question about the uh, quality of entrepreneurship. Clearly, that quality has to do with entrepreneurs' knowledge, and I know that uh, some government agencies, such as the SBA, offers regular uh, training programs for uh, potential entrepreneurs. How much do we know about the effectiveness of those programs? In particular, uh, how does those programs reduce the unnecessary risks mm -hmm. entrepreneurs take on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So at, when I was at the White House, we were having discussions with SBA over these programs. And they've been running for a long time, and they collect a lot of data uh, about them, which is, which is fantastic. What hasn't ha what would have not happened to date when I was there in 2010 was really an experimental design to the quality that you see with my fellow panelists in terms of evaluating the programs. I think that's starting to change. I don't know of a study like that that's come out uh, yet, but I think that kind of work is being done or being considered. I think it's being considered because I've been attending a bunch of conferences up with the federal government and with officials who have this on the brain. So the great news, I mean, look, if you're a business school professor or you're a business school student, you'll be forgiven for wondering, you know, all this research we do, does it really make an impact, right? But I can tell you that like the work with like basically experimental methods, randomized controlled trials, it's made a huge difference in the way people in the US government think. Now, they're hard to implement and it, it takes a little while, but I saw that mind shift when I was there. And that, it's relatively quick that this work has made an impact. I and mean, we all want things overnight at, at like Twitter speed, but it takes like a few, a few years to actually get this stuff in. And so OMB is, is putting pressure to the budgetary process to make sure those things happen as well, which is exciting. Also, um, I think the point I mentioned before about small firms and new firms, that distinction, that's a piece of research by John Haltwanger and co-authors that's really influenced the, the debate in Washington, how people think about entrepreneurship in a relatively short amount of time. I don't know when that paper came out in RE Stat, but um, you know, it's relatively recently. And so academic research like that, that's very topical, right, that speaks to a salient policy issue that you know, also can be aligned with maybe where people want to go to begin with, right, it's not counterintuitive, it can be really, really influential. And I see SBA and Commerce and the other departments that deal with business moving in that direction with the caveat that it's quite hard to execute. There's a lot of us who are chomping at the bit to get in there and do it, but there's a lot of barriers to, to getting it done um, in the U.S. context. Um, they certainly are aware of it and they're trying to. I don't know of a study so far, and maybe there's people in the audience who do, who can show you the technical systems from the SBA in a treatment and control kind of model. They'll tell you much more about how many clients have come through the door and what they did for them and how, how much money those businesses are worth and how many jobs they created. Those are great statistics and a good start, but they're not um, at the level we would need to do the evaluations that, that my panelists are doing here. 
I just wondered, kind of looking back over the whole day and, and the conversations that we had about bandwidth earlier, um, in your conversation about the, the need for capital and training uh, or not, do you think is, is entrepreneurship a prescription for policy, poverty alleviation and maybe distinguish between the U.S. and, and third world countries? You guys go first, Emma. I'll start with that one. Um, so I do think that, in, in, in Amit's right, that the, there is some sense, especially in, in these places where market finance is operating, where the labor market doesn't work so well. If people want to go get a wage job, it just doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. You know, their only option is the aspiration of a government job, and they tell us we want the government job so we can go sign our name and then go home for the day. Um, so, so they just really don't have that many options. And then uh, I think Abhijit Banerjee and Poor Economics coined this as forced entrepreneurship. So it's it's the alternative to unemployment rather than a business that actually has scope scope for growth. Now I think you know in some parts of, of the world, and in some places, uh, some stages of development. Development, this is important because there aren't jobs, but um, it's right. The the once growth starts and once you know good jobs, quote unquote, come, they should crowd out some of this entrepreneurial activity. I guess uh, maybe the only thing I'd add is the you know what I was discussing and the kind of entrepreneurship I'm looking at is not the solution to poverty or inclusive growth. It's it, it might relieve poverty a little bit on the margins, but you know the difference between. Uh, going from being a, say, a Kenya to a Chile, uh, or a Kenya to a, a, a Vietnam, um, is, is, is going from $2,000 per person to eight or 10 or $12,000 per person, and that's never been done, as far as I know, in the history of human race without manufacturing value added from medium and large firms uh, that are employing large numbers of people. It's just mechanically, all of these micro enterprises and small businesses cannot and are not and have never been productive enough to produce the kind of income per person that comes with middle income status. And, and so the kind of little entrepreneurship that we're looking at is, 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 is a humanitarian effort uh, in, in the meantime uh, is, is, is probably the right way to look at it. Uh, I mean, I would just say, in the U.S. context, I mean, I think we need to do more. Uh, look at a program like, uh, there's a pilot program called Self-Employment Assistance, and what they're basically doing is trying to, in some states are experimenting with converting the unemployment insurance money to uh, give people some business training and allow them to start a new business. Now, if you're a politician, that was a great program to tout. I mean, can you imagine going to town halls uh, across your state and saying, I'm going to change our unemployment program, so instead of people passively may, uh, getting these benefits, they're going to turn into active job creators. Sounds awesome, right? Great program, and we definitely should pilot it. But if you're reading the research that these folks have done and, and you're thinking about it in a rational way, you might wonder, gosh, are we going to be routing people to like industries where there's very low barriers to entry and a lot of competition, where they're going to be worse off than if we had given them job training to get a job at a big company? Um, especially when you think of the composition of the long-term unemployed, who that might be targeted to, this program. So I think I, I like these pilots because I think we need to build our knowledge, but uh, I think we should be careful before we sort of embrace them fully. So I, I think they're doing exactly the right thing with pilots, but let's be careful and collect evidence in a rigorous manner, evidence by the, by the panels, and then make policy based on that. And that would be maybe an answer to your question in the U.S. context based on this uh, SEA program. I think it's, it's being rolled out in a couple states. Yeah, I got a question for you. Uh, how do you ca characterize an entrepreneur, like to be or not to be? I mean, it's very easy to fail as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, this, it's, it's an obstacle that you have to face through. So you, you can get sidetracked side easily. Yeah. But how do you measure that? Yeah. So, so, I mean, in academic studies, I can tell you what we do, and then I'll tell you how we do it in real life, and then I'll tell you how we do it in government statistics, okay? So in, in business schools, I think, uh, to the man's point from INSEAD, I mean, most of our students are not coming in to run, or at least their aspiration is not to run a traditional small business as, as broadly defined. They're looking to start the next Facebook or Google or Twitter or WhatsApp or Instagram, right? And that's a very different kind of business with very high growth aspirations. So I'd say in business schools, an informal cut is between kind of those businesses that get venture capital back funding, which is like less than 1% in the United States, although they have outsized economic impact, to be fair, versus all the other businesses. That's, a, I think, in business schools. Government statistics, we have many different measures, right? You can look at things like self-employment statistics, which show you that the person is you know, starting or is, is employing themselves. Often they don't have any employees, so that's a distinction you have to decide what to call that. The SBA uses the number of employees to characterize how big a small business is. In some industries, that can be as many as 500 employees, so it's very, it's very wide depending on industries. So, so there's, there's not a, a, a razor-sharp definition of entrepreneurship across these different sort of settings. A lot of people are starting to think more 
more about sort of growth orientation and the aspirations of the entrepreneur themselves and how big they want the business to go, it's also very noisy to measure. But, but that's kind of what people are doing right now. In studies, we, we use things like zero one variables for self-employment, venture capital back funding, all sorts of different things to kind of get at that. But, uh, but it's not an easy process. And there's a lot of controversy of what you're really measuring, at least in the studies that I've done. Do we have time for one more? Or we, I think we're, we're out of time. So. Oh. Oh, you have the microphone. Okay, last it's question. A, it's a small question. <laughs> last question. So this is a question for Chris. Um, I find it discouraging as well the bloating of en international NGOs and multilateral development agencies in the places, sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. And so I was just wondering what you think is the role for international NGOs, multilateral development agencies, as it relates to entrepreneurship, or should they just step away and drop money from the sky? I, I think there's a huge role for the types of development problems that can't be solved with money from helicopters uh, or money to mobile phones, and and any kind of collective action program problem, any kind of any kind of infrastructural issue. There's a whole, there's a range of things, any and a whole range of social services as well uh, that that cash doesn't replace. But when it comes to business development, uh, I think which is not a huge amount of aid, unfortunately, in some sense. When it comes to business development and helping people generate livelihoods, I think it's really gonna be, this is gonna be a really hard benchmark for most organizations to match, and I think they're recognizing that. My wife is the, uh, a leader and research director at um, one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world, and they're fundamentally rethinking all of their economic development work out of this kind of research, which has just emerged in the last five years. So there, there actually is really transformative change on this front, and, uh, and, 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 and a lot of the NGOs are seriously rethinking what they're doing, which is, which is great news. So I'd like to say thank you to the panelists, and thank you for your insightful questions. Step down. Can you, great, thank you so much. So this would just take a few, a few seconds, so. Just wanna thank everyone for coming in. Ronnie, uh, thanks so much for flying in from, uh, from Duke. So it's great to hear you again, and I appreciate that you uh, stayed part of our, of our community. It's really, really nice of you. Um, I think we had a very interesting and lively uh, day. I'm very appreciative to uh, my colleagues for coming out. Chris, uh, as well, for, uh, for joining us, uh, Emily and, um, uh, Amit uh, did all get a great, uh, great job uh, in presenting things. Uh, so it's been nice to hear the research side. We always try to have research involved in these conferences uh, to show you what we're doing. It also tells you whether we're ahead or behind on certain issues. And you usually tell us where we fall on these uh, on these matters, and that's uh, that's helpful uh, to us quite a quite a bit. This is an important topic. Uh, I think you all agree upon that. This is something we should do more. We had a lot of students from SEPA come in, which is uh, makes sense because it's on their agenda, but it should also be on the agenda of business schools, which Ronnie also uh, talked about. And we take note that there are um, uh, mistakes in the data on small businesses, and there's differences in uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, but still, if you want to have uh, jobs created, we have to identify those entrepreneurs and make sure that we're helping uh, grow them and, uh, and find them. Uh, thanks very much to all of you on the Skylark Foundation for, uh, for helping us uh, finance this uh, particular uh, conference as well. I'd like to have my my dear friend and academic dean, I uh, say last words. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I just wanted to end by saying that this is not just an important topic, but it's really important at Columbia Business School from the perspective of our students, as well as, as you saw, a number of our faculty. We're all really engaged deeply in this. We care a lot, and the school really supports this work. And thanks the Bernstein Center for taking the lead in putting up this conference and also the lead in really trying to create collaborations uh, between the university, the business school, and uh, across the space outside as well. So I'd like to thank Bruce, Sandra, Heather, and Tiffany. I know they worked really hard to put this together, and I think it was a great event. So thank you. Thank you.